started researching about CP Pinellas uh, in about 2018 because I wrote an article about her in Type Magazine. So um, in about 2019, I gave a version of this talk at the Catherine Small Gallery in Boston, Massachusetts. And since then, I've been reprising it. I've been changing it up and mostly for students at RIT, especially those studying graphic design history. Because as a custodian of C.P. Pinellas' collection here at RIT, and as someone who facilitates research in that collection, I, am, I feel so strongly that her accomplishments really merit her the status of being a household name in the history of graphic design. And I'm not alone with this because my colleagues at the Carey Collection, given the chance, I think all of us, uh, if somebody knocked on the door and said they wanted to see materials from the graphic design archive, we all kind of turn to C.P. Pinellas as somebody who really represents this archive very well. Her work is always excellently executed. She was so talented. And not only that, the content is extremely accessible because she worked for such high profile brands that are, that are household names in themselves, like Vogue and Seventeen Magazine. So uh, we're gonna get to her in a moment, but this collection, this talk, starts off with a little bit of an introduction to the Carey Collection and then moves quite quickly into CP. So I hope you enjoy and I look forward to all your comments at the end. So if technology will smile upon me, we will share the screen. So um, here you're seeing the reading room of the Carey Collection. So if you haven't been here, we are one of the finest rare book libraries in the country on the graphic arts. And that covers so many different subject areas. We have over 45,000 books in the library and hundreds of primary source archives. So I want to give you a taste for what we collect at the Cary, but I want to do it through the lens of contributions of women that we hold in the library. So for instance, the Carey Collection collects examples of historic and collect, uh, contemporary rare books. This is a fairly new acquisition. It's a complete musical manuscript written on vellum in 1509 from Italy. It has these beautiful details like ornate hand-drawn initial, initials and little angels in the cartouche. While this work may have been written by a scribe who was a man, it was commissioned by a wealthy woman one Dorothea Leonardi for her convent. You can imagine how many women sung from this over the centuries. By extension, this is a unique example of modern calligraphy in the collection by the famous type designer, Gudrun Zoff von Hess. She was with us just until last year and lived over 100 years. She made an impact in the design world, creating typefaces using her calligraphic handwriting as models. This piece by uh, Antoine de saint exupery translates roughly as, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Also, the Carey Collection is really strong in materials related to bookbinding. This photograph doesn't do it justice, but I wanted to show here a collection of miniature fine bindings by the Canadian master bookbinder, Louis Genet. It is this world survey of bookbinding styles in this tiny little cabinet of curiosities. And we often use it to inspire students about history of the book and bookbinding. RIT also holds an extensive collection on printing history. And for this, I feature a 1934 edition of Frankenstein, published by the Limited Editions Club. It was designed by a well-known typographer named Frederick Gowdy, of which RIT holds the complete archive. However, I want to call attention to his wife, Bertha Gowdy, who was the hand typesetter for many of her husband's works, including this edition of Frankenstein. This was a skill for which she was really admired um, in her time. And it's one I'm proud to say that I carry on 
as the manager of the Cary Technology Collection, where I print and teach with vintage letterpress printing presses. So I'm kind of exhausted right now telling you about what's in the Cary Collection, but of course we're all here to learn more. And that brings me to the main subject of today's talk, um, which is the materials held in our graphic design uh, collections. These collections are about four dozen designers who worked in the mid 20th century modernist tradition. So all of the famous talented mad men, if you're familiar with that TV series of graphic design are represented here, including people like Lester Beale, who designed the long lasting graphic identities like that at International Paper and Caterpillar Tractor. Or for example, Alvin Lustig of paperback book, paperback book cover fame. He was so influential in that field. And Will Burton, who was the designer of trade show exhibits for big pharmaceutical companies and the 1964 World's Fair. Well, that's all well and good, but where are the mad women, so to speak? You know, the women who worked in graphic design from the same time period. Well, at last count, only about 19% of the designers in the archive are women. Now, I can't correct the inequalities of a generation, but hopefully I can shed light on one of the superstars of this archive. And that's, of course, C.P. Pinellas, our art director extraordinaire. I entitled this talk this way because not only was she a talented art director for editorial design, but she was an extraordinary illustrator and letterer and art educator as well. She broke into a man's world with style and she deserves to be part of the canon of the history of graphic design. Sipi, her given name was Sipora, was born in 1908 and she emigrated from Vienna with her family in 1923. She went to Pratt Institute eventually, and she taught watercolor after that time. She broke into magazines as she worked as an assistant to the famed art director, Dr. Uh, M.F. Aga at Condé Nast, specifically in Vogue and Vanity Fair. She did this as his assistant from 1932 to 38. This picture here I'm showing is a gouache that C.P. Pinellas painted depicting Dr. Aga's office with this kind of swarm of fashion editors pitching their articles. You can imagine the cacophony of women's voices as they were trying to jostle to get their pieces in the magazine. CP, she's completely absorbed and uh, at the right of the picture in artwork in the office and kind of ignoring all of this chittering you can imagine. Here's a collage in the archive that she mocked up for Vogue and then the resulting final cover. So this is a collage of photographs of pieces of jewelry and then this clipping of hands and a face and then the resulting piece that finally went to press um, in 1939. From 1939 to 46, she worked at Glamour magazine and eventually became its art director. In her archive here, there are several of these planning sheets that she would create for the layout of each issue. They're done with gouache and pen and ink. And occasionally, we set a student at RIT to page through and find the corresponding, print, the corresponding printed issues to match the illustrated guides to their planning sheet. So as you can see here in this guide, there's this pink and purple uh, layout, and you can see how she really imagined it in the, the planning sheet there and how it was eventually executed. I love to show these to students of graphic design to get them inspired to think about and draw out their ideas before they go to press. Sipa was pretty accurate, as you can see, when she got to this, this stage of production for sequencing the imagery of that magazine in addition to the typography. Let's look at this red cover from 1942 when she was just promoted to art director at Glamour. It's this tour de force of photo montage, hand lettering, and typography. That G is fashioned out of cut paper. Just like this tagline, any girl can make herself at least 50% more attractive 
<laughs> I think these freestyle effects of lettering are at least 50% more attractive than the spindly Bodoni-esque mastheads that took over soon after in fashion publications. And you can see those on the right, those kind of skinny letters there, very thin. Sometimes I call them as thin as the models, um, but this wonderful exuberant hand lettering in her work. But you know, fashion, especially editorial fashion, is fickle, and she often had to change the look of her pages. So I'm going to read a quote from her. In the fashion world, which was my training ground, nobody looked for definitions. They only looked for an effect. The arrangement of pictures and text on the magazine spread was an exercise in lack of self-control. Photographs were not always cropped. Sometimes we tore them. Sometimes we burned the edges, perforated them, pinked them, curled them. Every editorial spread was designed to create a new surprise within the magazine, a shock a change of pace from the preceding and following one. Kind of a contrast to modernism, isn't it? During World War II, C.P. Pinellas married another designer who would become very famous, and his name was Bill Golden. You may know him as the designer of the CBS Eye logo. But she carried on her own career. In 1947, she got a very singular opportunity to take the first magazine for teens, especially girls, called Seventeen to New Levels. And I want to direct your attention to her team in the black and white photograph at the bottom. Helen Valentine on the left was the editor, CP was the art director, and Estelle Ellis was the promotion director. So the three of these talented women worked together to open up a new target market for consumerism, young women. CP worked there until 1950. She, off the bat, employed a really talented group of illustrators and photographers to make Seventeen visually groundbreaking. She employed Ben Shahn, Jacob Lawrence, Andy Warhol, and the cartoonist Hirschfield. She spoke about how she got fine artists to work for her in a 1958 speech about Ben Shahn. She said, some years ago, I tried an experiment. I wasn't the first American art director to introduce the work of painters into mass publications, but I did have an opportunity to do it on an important and consistent scale. I was the art director of a new magazine called Seventeen. It, it was a stimulating publication edited by Helen Valentine, who had discovered a new world of young people people who hadn't enough experience to know what an acceptable illustration should be. These young people seem to represent as nearly as uncorrupted and unprejudiced audience as one could find. I thought there was an opportunity to give them a new experience in seeing that was spoiled for an older generation. It seemed to me that if magazine fiction pages were illustrated by painters, then the readers would either accept or reject them without being challenged to accept them as art. And then maybe some pe young people would be moved by these paintings. My plan was to give the artist a story, let him decide what to paint, and insist that we would only publish the picture only if he liked it well enough to exhibit in his own gallery. It would have to stand on its own as a painting, even when it was divorced from the magazine pages. And she said, obviously, the only way a program like this could work was by example. And so I needed a conspirator and one of the first was Ben Sean. So it's a really great insight about the art world that was moving along and collaborating with the editorial world in New York City at that time. But CB worked with a lot of artists, but she also rolled up her own sleeves and added her own illustration to the layouts. She also had photo shoots done at her Victorian home in upstate New York. It seems like she just lived this admirable life of design. In 1948, C.P. Pinellas became the first woman to gain membership into the Art Directors Club. Her former boss, Dr. Aga, had nominated her repeatedly for years, but she was always denied. Her husband, Bill Golden, had been an extended membership in 1948, and he declined saying he didn't wish to join a men's social club, but a professional club that also admitted women. 
So Sibi was finally then allowed entry. Later in 1975, she would become the second woman inducted into the Art Directors Club Hall of Fame. A little quick aside is that only 10% of these Art Directors Club Hall of Famers are women even today. I counted them from 1974 to 2012. So, CP, she was a seasoned professional in magazine publishing and she moved to Charm in 1950 and she stayed there for a decade. Charm was a magazine targeted at the young urban woman looking, who was living between school and marriage. I want you to look at the cover at the left. I think the sleekness depicted in CP's convergence of imagery and typography is so masterful in Charm, is very modernist uh, for sure. This kind of allusion to sophistication attracted these readers who were searching for, as you can see the tagline, the miracles for women who work. I'm still searching for these miracles. Um, but look at the models, flawless composure. It's enough to eclipse the everyday problems seen in the monospace words at the background. Like those words are saying, moth-proofing, lipstick that won't smudge, wrinkle-resistant. And the one that I just saw this morning, drugs to keep you on the job. What was happening in 1950? Anyway, C.B. Pinellas won awards repeatedly for her art direction during her tenure at Charm Magazine. I find layouts like these to be particularly fresh and modern, that collision of um, typography elements, but also elements that are on a diagonal in addition to the rectangular linear elements there. And the photography is just so well done, even if we could never fit in those outfits today. Um, this is in C.P. Pinellas' archive here at RIT. It's this large sheet of paper with copies of all the charm covers that she designed. She pasted this up as a quick record of her work. It's these kinds of ephemeral documents in her archive that are just wonderful to show students. And I like to show this particularly to students to say that, look at how she's taken the, the actual main image and really worked with the masthead typography. Sometimes it's eclipse, sometimes it's broken, sometimes it's the typography is in front of the model, sometimes it's behind. Doesn't mean you could, it's not always formulaic. She actually broke the, the model or broke the form of that repeatedly, which is so inventive. So I have to continue and mention a personal footnote about her life because I think any person can relate to hardship, even admits this really great success. Um, while she was at Charm, CP and Bill Golden adopted a son whose name was Tom. Shown here is a birthday card she later painted for him. She was 41 years old when she became a mother. Just a few later, years later, in 1959, Bill Golden suffered a heart attack and died very suddenly. Sipa was widowed, and after this event, she shifted her gears out of magazine design. Understandably, a very fast-paced career. Instead, she began to work in the design firm of Will Burton, whom I mentioned earlier as one of those madmen of design. The Goldens and the Burtons had been friends for years, traveling in the same New York design circles. Will Burton also had lost his wife near about the same time. And eventually, Pinellas and Burton married in 1961. Her career post-magazines really flourished. For five years, she handled Lincoln Center's account and designed its graphic identity. I love these really simple sketches of her process work in trying to solve the problem of designing the logo that you'll see in the annual report on the right. So again, a beautiful piece to show students to get them thinking about how many iterations have to come first before the final product. C.P. Pinellas also taught publication design for over 20 years at Parsons School of Design in New York. While at that time, she was working as a consulting designer for the actual school. 
These are diploma mock-ups that show her facility with hand lettering. And then the final result where she collaborated with another well-known designer, Tom Carnese, who was working in New York City at the time. Tom Carnese is one of the designers of the avant-garde typeface and many others. In 1983, Parsons established a scholarship in CP's name. And that still continues. You might recognize these Parson campaign posters where all the schools that they ran are represented by an illustrated fruit. New York is the apple, of course. LA is the orange and Paris is the grape. Uh, these particular pieces really resonate with me because as a kid in the 1980s, I had some of these posters. And in the archive here is one of these original drawings that she was the art director for uh, to show the apple changing. By 1985, at the age of 77, C.P. Pinellas landed the cover of Print Magazine, along with a long article that traced her career. Here's an appropriate quote from it. Pinellas herself was something of a trailblazer as a trend-setting, full-time art director who was also a wife and a mother, she was the quintessential feminist, even before, before the term was coined. Now, C.B. Pinellas died in 1991, but thankfully celebrations about her accomplishments, like what we're doing today, didn't stop at all. She received the AIGA medal in 1996, and of course that's the American Institute for Graphic Artists, um, that's their professional organization, and it's, it's like the Lifetime Achievement Award. So thankfully, she was recognized there. And wonderfully, monographs about her have not ceased to be published. So the finest one, most comprehensive one, is the one on the left there by Martha Scottford called C.P. Pinellas, A Life in Design. I highly recommend getting your hands on this book um, if you want to learn about her life. It really is well told. And all of the illustrations are from the RIT uh, Graphic Design Archive and her family. I was fortunate when I worked for RIT Press in 2004 to publish a little chapbook called C.P. Pinellas Two Remembrances, and you can see that in the upper right. That little book uh, publishes two very heartfelt essays by people who knew her. Her adopted daughter, Carol Burton Fripp, and also one of her colleagues, Estelle Ellis, who worked at uh, Seventeen Magazine. So it gives a, a personal and a working perspective of this lovely woman. And finally, the thing that kind of pushed me to re-examine CP, even after working on the 2004 book, was a book that came out fairly recently called Leave Me Alone with the Recipes. And this book came out of the blue. We were contacted by uh, an illustrator named Wendy McNaughton, who, along with her friend, Sarah Rich, they were at a book fair on the West Coast, and apparently before the collection came to RET, some of the pieces were distributed to family. So a, a recipe book that CP illustrated was uh, somehow wound up at this book fair, and so Wendy McNaughton fell in love with the illustrations and she and Sarah purchased it and then republished this recipe book by CP. And it kind of turned into this explosion of wonderful thought about her life um, because different uh, graphic design luminaries were invited to give some remembrances there too. So I was happy to see that come along again. So, and that brings us to last year or in 2018 when I pitched an article to, about CP to Roger Black, uh, who was the previous art director of Rolling Stone magazine. He was launching a, a magazine called Type. It was great and he accepted it because I was able to reprise her story again for a different audience. But the piece that I submitted was also augmented because Roger had some noted women in the field like Paula Scher, Louise Feely, and Eileen Strisberg chime in with CP memories. So um, here's one that Paula Scher wrote, and it's a little scathing. 
Sepia and I were 40 years apart. She was a legend and I was a young designer, but I felt no age or status difference. She showed me a mailer that she had just received from the art director's club for a series of lectures entitled, An Evening with One of the Best. There were about 12 men in the picture who were each giving a lecture at the club. CP said, couldn't they even find one token woman for this? Even one who isn't very good? Just one to keep up appearances? We couldn't decide which was worse, the group arrogance or the laziness. Well, it's 40 years later, and I'm the age that CP was when we first met. And really, not all that much has changed. So that's Paula Scher's take on learning, getting to know CP. But I'm most proud of publishing this article um, because I was able to get C.P. Pinellas' own words in print in Type Magazine so many years after her death. You see, she was the only woman at the Art and Science of Typography Conference in Silvermine, Connecticut in 1958. This was put on by the, art, the Type Directors Club. She was in really amazing company, as you can see, listed there. Some of the luminaries of typography, some of the people who were designing posters in Europe and in Asia, and publishing books, too, and that list there. She delivered a talk called The Chemise in Typography. So it's a 12-page TypeScript document that's in the RIT Graphic Design Archive. And I'm so happy that I had it published in full 60 years after she delivered the talk. So I'd like to finish today by quoting CP from that talk. So, Mr. Webster defines fashion as a way of conforming. It might offend the painters of today to be labeled conformist. It might even offend the graphic designers, but that isn't my intention here. I think any visual manifestation can and should serve as an inspiration to a designer. But I think we ought to feed on abstraction with care. It can be pretty indigestible. Graphic design is useless if it communicates nothing, but there may be a ray of hope I'm talking about the scientific age. Apparently scientists have something to say, and it is important that we understand it and communicate it to others. The electronic machines are able to communicate with each other pretty well. Surely those designers who are crying out to work with more important content, designers who feel they are stuck in the rut of outmoded fashion, who fight against convention, only to find they are too conformist, will welcome the scientific age. I don't mean to imply that modern typography, are, those habits are bad merely because they have been borrowed or because they're not new. I mean, they should be taken not so seriously. No one specific fashion should be considered a permanent solution. They could be fun while they last, but please let's not make them last so long. And if it makes you sad to see them go, Maybe it will cheer you up a little when you remember that another generation will discover them. So, and that is my talk on C.P. Pinellas. Thank you so much for coming today and listening to me speak about her, who was this extraordinary talent in graphic design. So. Thank you so much, Amelia. That was, uh, that was, Delightful. I haven't heard that talk yet, despite the fact that you've been giving it for a while. So it was a real pleasure for me to hear it. And I'm sure we all uh, feel the same. Um, anybody who has questions, please um, pipe up or type something in the chat. Any comments? Um, anything? You're welcome. In the meantime, I have set up a kind of a document camera so I can show some of the items from the archive. So we can kind of try to to try out our technology here. You know that's always a delight. So let me see if I can get this to go. Thumbs up, has anybody heard about CP Pinellas or teaches about CP? 
I've heard of her quite a bit. This is awesome. <laughs> awesome. Super. Excellent. So let me see if I can start the video for this. If you look carefully, you can see two Amelia's right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to find my, I'm going to spotlight this video. So if that's the side of my head. <laughs> I'm going to come down here to the actual piece. So what we're looking at right now is one of C.P. Pinellas' planning sheets for Glamour magazine. So this is a particular piece that I love to show students because I think a lot of students um, do some sketches for work, but maybe they don't carry it out in such a comprehensive way that she would have. So these are gouache drawings that she did for every issue. So if you imagine every month she had to execute something like this. And they're so detailed here with little notes about where the color breaks were going to be um, and notes about who was going to do the illustration, for example. But what's great, I want to call your attention to this piece right here with the hands because this is an example of where we set our students to find the spreads and see how they compared with the sketches. And so we actually have a photocopy of the spread that came out of that article, out of that issue, here. And that happens to be, I think it's kind of funny, the title is Nail That Man. <laughs> We're talking 1941 here. Um, and then, but that's an illustration by C.P. Pinellas there. So that finally got published in the magazine. One thing I love about looking at these gouaches and then thinking about that quote that you read, Amelia, at the end. Um, and I, it's, it's funny because I think of Will Burton as being a person who was very into like systems information design because he was always, um, you know, building these uh, sort of inhabitable spaces that would talk about science and technology to the viewer. But when you look at one of these layouts, it's clear that CP is approaching her work in the same way. Um, that she's really analytical about it and she's really disciplined about it and she understands that information communication is a very specific um, set of skills and techniques and she's really employing them and I really like that other window onto, you know, she's talking about computers and she's talking about science and it's like she gets all of that and she works that way and I think that's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and I, you know, I think the fashion world demanded that kind of surprise she was talking about, but I think yep. her way of dealing with that constant reinventing was to, to adhere to some kind of grid. You could see there's a grid structure in these layouts um, to adhere to those modernist tenets that were put forward in, in, in publication design at that time, even if they had to have burned photographs or pinked photographs, you know, <laughs> cut up things. Um, so I did want to, oh, I see a, a, a question from Sarah. Curious if you see a difference between her early Every Spread Different work for Seventeen Magazine and her later work. Also, does she write or speak in a particular about any special typefaces? So, um, yes. So the first one, the second question I'll ask in that chemise and typography, she does talk about specific typefaces. So you can access the whole article on, on uh, typemag.org, or I just recently put it, the TypeScript, the original document, in uh, our RIT digital collection. So you can look at the original document, too. She does, she talks about Bodoni, and she says something about, um, she's so tired of sans serif types something like that. She really has a funny way of putting it in there in the article. Um, yes, you do see a difference between early work of 17, which is teen oriented, and especially Charm magazine. When she works at Charm, you know, she is in this very disciplined, I think, um, 
presentation mode for that that set of of young women women between marriage and work or work and marriage so it's a different continuum and when she's at parsons in the 1970s it go, all goes kind of out the window because she actually is the um, faculty member who's responsible for the Parsons yearbook that the students do every year. And it's not a yearbook, it's actually whatever they wanna publish in. Uh, so one year they just decided to do something on bread. So it's basically photographic. Um, it's a, it's the bread kind is of amazing. A, yeah, free for all of 1970s design. So, um, all right, so somebody else is asking me, what about what size is each sketch they look to be only two or three inches tall but they're so detailed yes absolutely so i'm just going to put my finger here for scale so yep so tiny tiny sketches there um but yeah to do it for every single issue it's pretty amazing yeah i would i would say for anybody who um, has the opportunity to um to come in and see these gouaches. Um, we take them out once in a while. Um, they're, of course, fragile because of the material, but there's no substitute for getting to see them in person. Um, and we will be operating by appointment in the fall um, for as long as things hold up the way they are. So uh, if you want to make an appointment with us, definitely email us. Um, these gouaches are, are something you can you can really only understand when you, you know, it's, it's when you get into, into the in-person experience they're they're so detailed and such fine work and um and and lovely to uh to pour over and this yeah and amelia is showing the original um aga office gouache as well which is just a beautiful piece um again that I'm sorry about the glare there but coming in a little closer here So anyway, and that one is about five by seven or about six by eight. So it's a, quite a, a small piece there and actually enlarged from the type magazine, which they did put it on the cover. So anyway, let's see. So um, Carl, hi Carl, is asking, did she need to react to changes in technology through her career? Photo typesetting must have been dominant in the end. Absolutely. There's a in Martha Scottford's book. There's um, there's a lot of quotes by her, by C. B. Pinellas, and she talks about when she worked at Seventeen and how she had to. At that time, it would have been um, rotary uh, letterpress, so relief printing. So all of her stuff would have been photographed, then translated into a film that would have been then eventually, or not, excuse me, translated into a film, um, the illustrations would have been photographed, but the type would have been typeset by linotype or monotype. So, and then put on a relief printing press. And so she talked about, there's this great quote, how she had to insinuate herself in the printing process. So actually get to know the pressmen and um, show them that she was interested in what they were doing in order for her to get the product that she wanted. So I think that, you know, a lot of people now who work in editorial or any kind of printing, you know, they're, you're used to doing a press check and understand talking to the pressman and talking about changes. But for a woman to do that, it kind of was a, a novel thing to be the one to tell the pressman that she needed something more cyan and more yellow, et cetera. So she was working letterpress early 17, but phototype setting absolutely by the time in the end of her career in the 70s, working for Parsons. And that diploma that I showed you was, um, you could see the films. She was, that was actually a film. So an acetate film that would have been gone to phototype setting for offset printing. Um, Barb Manchi is asking if uh, C.P. Pinellas' son went into the design field. And uh, no, he did not. Uh, he did not. Her adopted daughter, Carol Burton, who was Will Burton's daughter, CP actually adopted her when she was an adult. There's a funny excerpt about how they both had to go into the health and human services and get interviewed like they would do for child adoption, but they did it <laughs> as adults. And so they had a, a particularly special love, but 
her, um, her adopted daughter went into the television industry in Canada. So she had some creative outlet there, but the son did not. All right, well, um, what I'd like to do actually, because I know some people, and I know Richard Minsky's on, and he told me he met C.P. Pinellas, so I was hoping we could uh, have some people talk about their own experiences if they wanted to. Is that true? Is, is Richard still there? You. Oh, there you are. Hi, Richard. Uh, hi, Amelia. No, it was not that I met her. I actually would have met her, except that the year that she did the Center for Book Arts uh, invitation to our annual open house, which was 1978, I had been made the US-UK Bicentennial Fellow in Visual Art and was sent to the United Kingdom to be an artist for a year. And I appointed Fabio Cohen, a bookbinding student of mine, to be the president of the center in my absence. And Fabio, who was a vice president of Random House, he was in charge of the juvenile division and published all the books of Random House, Pantheon, and Knopf. And of course, CP was a friend of his, so while I was gone, he said to CP, I've got this uh, event, would you do an invitation for me? Uh, I, can, I can pull it up if you want me to show it. Uh, oh, I'd love to see it. Okay, let's see if I can. Yeah. Um, uh, or we can do it at a later time. Uh, well, I will, I, will, um, I will find it for you somewhere along the line here. That's great, because I actually, so Richard had emailed me and, I, and said, she did work for Center for Book Arts in New York City, and uh, I didn't find anything in the, in the archive. So it would be lovely to see that kind of extension, because I'm sure, you know, as you create work in your own personal life, how many of you save every single piece? <laughs> um, we're very fortunate that we have these huge collections and I think the C.P. Pinellas collection is about 144 boxes of material, plus ancillary material um, by none other than Estelle Ellis, her coworker at 17. So there's some material there in the collection that kind of backs up what C.P. did and it comes to it from Estelle's perspective as a collaborator at 17 Magazine. If you would enable uh, screen sharing, I found it and I can share oh, good. it. Let's see. Let me see. Okay, you should be all set, Richard. Can you see that? Sure. Okay, well, that's it. Um, what was interesting is he told her it had to fit in an eight and a half by 11 envelope. So instead of, I mean, a, a number 10 envelope. So instead of making it eight and a half by 11, she made it uh, four inches by 24. So it folded uh, that way. Uh, and so people would open this envelope and they would have this uh, two foot wide invitation. Oh, that's great. Super. Thank you for sharing that. And um, while I was <laughs> while I was preparing for this, I remembered that while I was working on that book, the little chapbook in 2004, uh, much in the same spirit as Phoebe and her friends at 17, uh, about three other women and I in the library here, we banded together and did a symposium called Magazines and Women, The Legacy of C.P. Pinellas. And uh, this was in 2005. And uh, we invited art directors from various magazines to talk about their working lives. <coughs> and, uh, and many of them didn't know about CP. So it was a wonderful opportunity. We had art directors from Essence, um, O, Oprah Magazine, uh, Real Simple. And um, we also had Estelle Ellis talk about her life as a working woman in the 1940s. So I'm in the process of digging up those videos. I'm, I'm really excited uh, I, because I just talked to, uh, it was Kari Horowitz, Marnie Soam, and Laura Heiss in the library. And we all worked on that together. So hopefully we can put those videos on YouTube and hear Estelle's perspective as working as a marketing manager, essentially, 
uh, for teenage girls in this new market that has become so important now. We have one more question from Barb. Um, do 17 and Charm archives exist? Do you know the answer to that question, Amelia? I don't know offhand. I know 17 is obviously still in production. And I just looked this up recently. Charm got per purchased by another publishing company and rolled into another publication. And I'd have to look it up again. Right. I don't know. But if you do do a search for images, you come up with these lovely resumes of all their um, their covers. But production uh, and process work, I don't know. You know, a lot of people would throw out stuff, and especially in the publishing world. Um, yeah, to keep those offices running, I feel like the amount of material that would have been produced every issue as far as process work, I can't imagine that that much of it was saved in, on a corporate level. Um, but designer by designer. We do um, at RIT libraries have quite a few issues of Seventeen and Charm um, that have come both with our archival collections but also collected by librarians over the years to, um, to supplement the collections that we have that are archival in nature. So um, several students um, in the last year have done really impressive projects with um, some of these historical fashion magazines um, and it, it's a great resource for for students and for faculty to um, to dig in and do do some research, so those are available. Um, they're not circulating, but you can view them um, by appointment in our reading rooms. So um, if you're interested in looking and you're able to come by, definitely make an appointment to do that because they're um, totally delightful to look through. So they're beautifully made things. There's um, Anne is posting a. Thank you. Charm was incorporated into Glamour. So there was a, there's a iteration there. So thank you very much, Anne. And then the obituary of Helen Valentine, who was the editor of uh, 17 and then went on to do other things. It's her New York Times um, obituary. So thank you, Anne, for that. Um, we're coming up on the end of our, our talk here and our time, but we want to hear from you, and so I want to encourage everybody to come visit us online right now, but we are going to be open for appointments, so if you'd like to come for an appointment, you can make an appointment with us, and I put, just put in the chat the way that you can get to us at the Carry Collection. Uh, we're really excited to see people again and get back to business, but we're also so thankful for this technology opportunity in showing our archives off to people from all corners of the country right now. So I really appreciate you coming today. And thank you, Ella, for moderating. And uh, we'll keep on keeping on, my friends. We'll see you soon. Thank you.